Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the biopsychosocial model of weight loss and ultimately how to turn your body into a fat burning machine. And so before we get into that, let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Sherry Shaban. I am the director of fitness in M1. I am your tribe facilitator. And I am, without apologizing for being awesome, arresting 17% body fat. Now I say this to you this morning because I want to share with you that I am anti-diet. I don't diet, I don't count my calories, I don't count my macros, I don't actually track these things. But instead, I am very intuitive with my body and I focus on that psycho, psychological model, the social model and the biological model to help create an identity that ultimately keeps your body at this fat burning machine. Now, the other part of the story is when I was 16, I was hit by a car. So um, I've, had, I've had a lot of struggles in my life with injury. I, I'll admit I never really struggled with weight loss, but at the time when I was hit by a car, I was in varsity sports. I was the first place winner in, in most track uh, events. I was a competitive swimmer. And when, when I had my accident, I was actually asked to not play sports again. And so I followed this advice for many, many years and actually found myself in a downward spiral where I was on pain medication. I was unable to really do any sports anymore. And in fact, I, I wasn't an athlete anymore. I spent time with a very different crowd doing a lot of different habits that did not align with an athletic identity. And so I did this for quite some years up until my early 20s where I just decided one day, this is not me, this is not who I am. It's not how I ever envisioned my life to be. And so I decided to walk into the gym against my doctor's orders, which was never exercise again, maybe do some light walking on a treadmill, and you're likely not going to be able to have a sex successful pregnancy because we don't know what the condition of your back was. And so I had my first back surgery just as I was turning 17. And when I started to get back into the gym, I had to overcome some limiting beliefs, obviously what the doctors had told me, and I had to find a way to train that continued to respect my body. And so after several months of just copying people in the gym and just doing what I saw around me, I started to notice that my back pain was a lot less. I was off of pain medication and that's really where I shifted my life. I was studying biochemistry at the time and I went into exercise science and athletic therapy. But all this to say is I did have a second back surgery in 2012. That second back surgery was a lot more intense. It was an emergency surgery. I was just a couple millimeters away from cauda equina syndrome. So that's complete paralysis of the lower body and you would basically have incontinence for the rest of your life and subject to a wheelchair. And so it didn't come easy for me. And what I wanna say to you is that I've never once had an intention around having a six pack. I've never once had an intention around becoming 17% body fat, but instead what I did is I changed my lifestyle and I changed who I was. So I changed who I spent time with. That is the social aspect of our model. Who are you spending time with? Are they people that push you? Are they people that drive you? We are the product of the five people we spend the most time with. We talk about this all the time here and you hear Rock talking about this as well. Whoever you spend time with, you will become. It is the law of nature, it's the law of universe. Like attracts like. And now the psychological aspect. Many of us have a goal around releasing weight and we think, okay, I want to release 10 pounds or I wanna release 20 pounds and we work on that. But the problem with that, whenever we set up this temporary sort of goal around a particular number that we want to release, what ends up happening is as soon as we achieve this goal, we stop working. Every February, I submit my taxes to the government. I work on them, it takes me a few weeks to just collect my stuff and to organize it. But the moment I submit it, I'm done, I stop working. And so when we set up our weight loss goals in the same way, the moment we achieve it, we stop working. And of course, if we don't work on the athletic identity, then what we end up doing is coming back to exactly who we are. Because whoever we think we are, however we view ourselves, whatever identity we have of ourselves, we subconsciously take actions every single day to support that identity. And that's why possibly many of us are constantly struggling and yo-yoing back and forth. We're doing the work, we're changing the nutrition, we're exercising, doesn't matter how expensive the trainer is or how much we invest, if in our minds we believe that we can't, if in our minds we are focusing on all the times it didn't work out, if in our minds we just don't see ourselves in this athletic identity, and in fact we punish ourselves through exercise and diet, we never achieve the results and we always end up going back. 
And so I'm just curious. And if you just ask yourself today, do I diet and exercise because I can't stand the way I look? Or is it really a part of my ritual? Because if every single time I have a salad and all I think about is, man, this is disgusting, this tastes really bad, I wish I was eating that poutine instead, or I have to eat the salad because I have to lose weight by March because I have to go on this trip, we start to download this negative emotion and associate it with eating something that serves us. And similarly, if we're deciding to commit to training and we hire a trainer or we decide to do an online program, but every single time we show up, all we're thinking about is how slow we are or how, how much we still have to go or how weak we are or how come I don't look like that person and we're constantly pooping on ourselves throughout the whole entire process, there's no way that we create love around this particular action. In fact, we stop doing it. Because whatever we associate negative emotions with, whatever action feels unkind, whatever action feels like a punishment to us, we're going to stop doing. And now that's the psychological aspect. And now let's bring on dieting. And somebody so bravely, so bravely yesterday commented on my post and she had said, you know what, I have a limiting belief around dieting. Why bother when it's all gonna come back? Right, and and here's what I wanna say. Stop dieting, just stop dieting. Dieting doesn't work. Yeah, sure, it works in the meantime because you're having these restrictions, but is it enjoyable? If I can't see myself doing something long-term that's sustainable, then what is the point? I'm just gonna release the weight. I might get a little excited, but then only to see it coming back. And all I do is create this pattern in my mind, this proof that no matter how much I try, it just never works. If you wanna feel completely confused, Go to your local bookstore and go through all the diet books in the diet book section. Every single one backed by science. Every single one claiming that this is how we should eat. It doesn't work that way. Eskimos have evolved to eat a certain way. And people in the Amazon have evolved to eat a different way. And what we want to do is find our way. And when we find our way and we stop focusing on the actual number, We stop focusing on that end product. I want to release X number of pounds. And instead focus on, I want to become the person who is X number of pounds lighter. I can now start to collect a list of habits that I can schedule. And maybe if I have no idea what those habits are, I could start spending time with people who are doing it. And I could model them. What time do they wake up in the morning? I can schedule that in. What's the first thing they eat? And what time is that? I can schedule that in. And when they do their groceries, what do they buy? I can definitely schedule that in too. What time do they go to bed? I can schedule that in. And what about their managing of stress and their sleep? How many hours of sleep do they get? I can also schedule that in. So instead of focusing on what I want to create, I want to focus on the person. Because when I focus on the person, I don't have to spend the majority of my day thinking about my body, thinking about my weight, thinking about what I'm eating, and constantly having this negative relationship with food. You know, I really believe that 90% of people struggling to release weight are focusing their thoughts, 90% of their thoughts on weight loss. The entire day, what should I eat? What shouldn't I eat? Oh my God, I just ate this. Oh my God, how many calories is that? What will that do for me? Oh my God, I look so bad. Oh, I can't stand myself. And now bring on the self-deprecating comments and thoughts and beliefs. That's not a way to live. So today I want to invite you to have a different perspective. And this perspective is around stop focusing on that end product. Stop focusing on the result. I know it's sometimes hard in this group because we're so result oriented. But instead, I want you to focus on your actions. And as you focus on your actions, I want you to ditch that diet mindset. I want you to to just let go and maybe even write out a list of, I've tried all of these diets and here's why they were doomed to fail. Really taking out carbs for the rest of my life? I was going to do that? That's bananas. How the hell was I was, I'm going to keep up with that? Impossible. And we, we live on carbs. Glucose is the energy currency of the body. All of these diets help us create restrictions. And the moment we start to eat again, we now have these set of rules around what is good and what is bad. These foods are good and these foods are bad. And when I eat these foods, I'm good. And when I eat these foods, I'm bad. 
And now I have an emotional attachment tied with these foods that I eat and tied ultimately with dieting. So athletes, yes, you are an athlete. An athlete is not a person who makes millions of dollars a year and is on TV. An athlete is a person who does not diet and exercise. An athlete is a person who focuses on their nutrition because it fuels their body. It helps them set up for the next workout and training session. It helps them recover. An athlete cares about who they spend time with. An athlete's diet is not just what they eat. It's what they watch. It's who they spend time with. It's what they listen to. It's their breath. All of this is our diet. And every single person has an athletic identity. An athletic identity is about the being. It's not about the doing. And so now think about all of the things that we can work on today to step into that being. And that first thing is waking up in the morning and congratulating yourself just for being you, loving yourself and honoring yourself for exactly how you are. So now those are what I call the psychological and the social aspects of turning your body into fat burning machine. But now let's talk about hormones because it's not about dieting. Dieting doesn't work. I think now we've established that. They say that repeating the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result is called insanity. So as soon as we try one, it doesn't work. Why are we trying to find the next one? If you go to a third world country, they all have normal weight. They don't spend their time dieting and restricting. They're eating and they're moving and they're loving and they're enjoying life. So now let's talk about hormones. And there's two hormones that I wanna talk about specifically today, but I just wanna tell you that this is a massive, massive topic. So our body has two modes. Our body is in either storage mode or it's in utilization mode. And so we can call that storage mode and let's say melting mode. So how do I get myself into a melting mode? Well, there's certain hormones that are responsible for the storage mode and there's certain hormones that are responsible for the melt mode. So let's quickly talk about the melt mode hormones. So we have growth hormone. Growth hormone is a hormone that we have in higher amounts when we are young. As soon as we reach adulthood, we make less of it. Somebody had commented, I think it was Alvina, as we age, we start to put on weight. There is some truth to that but it's not what you think. It's actually nothing to do with age. After the age of 25 for women and 28 for men, we start to put on a little bit of weight every single year because we lose 1% of lean body mass. This has to do with the reduction of growth hormone, but it also has to do with the fact that we're less active. You see, our muscles are our fat burning potential. The more muscle we have, the more calories we can burn at rest. So when we hit 25 as women or 28 as men and we're not exercising, we lose 1% of lean body mass every single year. Now the good news is it's reversible. If we start lifting weight, and I see this all the time, I work with people in their 50s and 60s and 70s and they're able to put on muscle and they're able to lean out. Again, who are we spending time with? Where are we getting our information? Maybe spend time with people who are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who are lean and crushing it. And so glucagon is another melt hormone. Glucagon is the opposite of insulin. It removes glycogen from the muscle tissue in the liver and releases energy. And then we have testosterone. And yes, testosterone is also something that women do produce. When you lift weights, when you do high intensity interval training, you are producing testosterone, helping you put on muscle, helping you increase your metabolic rate at rest. And then we have uh, adrenals, we have insulin-like growth factors, we have melatonin, and we have leptin and ghrelin. I wanna talk a little bit about leptin and ghrelin. These are the satiety hormones. Leptin is released uh, in the body to tell us that we are satisfied. So whenever we've eaten enough, whenever we have enough energy, we release leptin. We know we're full because leptin is in the bloodstream. And now ghrelin is the opposite. Ghrelin is the hunger hormone, and that's released in the body when we're low on nutrients, when we're hungry. And so through dieting and through a lot of disruption of our eating patterns, we end up disrupting our hormones. And so we don't know when to stop eating because maybe we've developed a binge eating disorder because we've dieted so much, because we've restricted so much, because psychologically we've created limiting beliefs around certain foods. And then because of this restriction, we've now created a reward system in the brain. 
and denying and preventing us from eating those foods and then finally having them makes us feel like we are in a desert and finally have a buffet after days and days of not eating. And we're actually designed to do that. We, we are designed to be able to binge eat massive quantities during periods of starvation, during periods of scarcity. And when we diet over and over and over again, we turn on that system. So it's not you is what I want to say to you. It's not you. It is the process. And it's these lies that were shared with us because people want to sell their books and they want to sell their products. But you have everything you need right now to create transformation. And now before we get into the storage hormones, and I want to be respectful of your time, and also Rock's going to kill me if I, if I go a little bit too long today. What we want to really focus on is how can we control these storage hormones? Now there's two big ones that we want to work on. Number one is insulin. And number two is cortisol. If we can manage these two hormones, if we can understand the process of these two hormones and then schedule it in, make sure that in our schedule, we're always focusing on how to control these two hormones, you will turn your body into a fat burning machine. But before we get into that and before we get into all these hormones, we need to understand one thing. Our gut is responsible for digestion. It's responsible for assimilation of nutrients. It's responsible for fat oxidation. If we have constant inflammation in the gut, we're constantly triggering the immune system, which is closely and intricately, intricately related to the gut microbiome. So the first things first, before I start focusing on these hormones, I want to focus on my gut. I want to make sure that I have no inflammation in my gut and my first priority would be gut health. Now, when you go to the doctor, you might have heard, well, if you want to be healthy, you have to release weight, but it's actually the other way around. If you want to release weight, you have to be healthy. If you want to release weight, you have to be healthy. And now that starts with reducing inflammation in the body. And inflammation comes from stress, environmental stress, social stress, chemical stress. Inflammation comes from the foods that we eat. Now, I don't think of food as being good or bad, but there certainly are more foods that serve us. And there are other foods that serve us less. The foods that serve us come directly from nature. They're in their natural form. They're, they haven't gone through many steps to become food on our plate. And now add to that, how is my food grown? Where is it raised? And what is the process? And now the foods that don't serve us, the foods that cause inflammation, the foods that our body doesn't recognize and puts in storage right away are the foods that are not natural to it. Those are the processed foods. Those are the foods with all the chemicals. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but I do encourage you to try it. It's actually kind of on my bucket list. I wanted to buy a Big Mac meal and just let it sit on my counter and just see what happens. Because if you've seen the YouTube videos, that shit doesn't rot. That's scary. Twinkies don't rot. So many of the foods that we eat don't rot. So if mold won't grow on it, I'm putting it in my body. If I wake up every morning and I believe my body is a temple and I love it. I make love to it every single morning through my words and through my kindness and through my actions. Then I'm not dieting, I'm choosing. And that's a very big difference. We get to choose. And now let me quickly talk to you about insulin and cortisol. Insulin is the storage hormone and it's released from the pancreas every single time we eat carbohydrates or proteins. And now here's the thing. When I eat carbohydrates, when I eat protein and my insulin rises, then all of the blood sugar is collected and gone to the muscle for storage and then gone to the liver also for storage and converted into glycogen. Now muscle has less of a capacity to store glycogen as the liver does. But when that capacity is full, when I've stored enough glycogen in my muscle and in my liver, the leftover glycogen will be converted into fat and stored in my fat cells. So insulin is that storage hormone. And so when my insulin is high, I'm in storage mode. I can exercise all I want. I can count my calories all I want. Because remember, the body doesn't count calories. It counts nutrients. It knows what's missing. It knows what it needs to thrive. It doesn't care that you ate 1500 calories today to release X number of pounds. 
It cares that it didn't get magnesium or sodium. It cares that it didn't get any antioxidants. It cares that it didn't get omega-3s. It cares that it didn't get fiber. And so how do I provoke insulin? Well, if I eat a high carb meal, insulin is up. And here's the thing, when insulin is up and I'm in storage mode, another thing happens. I suppress fat release because that makes no sense, right? If I'm in storage mode, why would I also be pulling out my fat from, from storage? I'm in storage mode. So if I continue to stimulate insulin all day long by eating frequently, by eating processed foods, by eating sh sugars, especially fructose, high fructose corn syrup, which by the way, goes directly to the liver and maxes out the liver storage, making everything very easy to convert to fat. If I eat processed foods, if I eat frequently, if I eat right before bed, all of this puts me in storage mode. So now I want you to think about this. What could I do to control the release of insulin? Well, I don't want to restrict calories because that's the thing is my body's not dumb. If I start restricting calories, then all of a sudden it's going to slow down its metabolism. It's going to think we're dying. My body doesn't want to do that. If I went into a calorie deficit, which I think Lucas mentioned, if I went into a calorie deficit, that might work out really well for four or five days. But my body's like, whoa, you're taking 500 calories away from me every single day. Wait a minute. In six months, where am I going to be? It thinks we are in scarcity. It thinks I'm in the middle of a desert somewhere and there's no access to food. So it slows down my metabolism. I suddenly start to feel tired. I start to slow down a little bit. I start to not feel like training. I start to crave sugar. So reducing calories doesn't work. But restricting when I'm going to eat does. And so now here's the good thing. We can control our fat oxidation through intermittent fasting, which a few of you mentioned. Instead of cutting calories, we cut the time of when we're gonna eat. Because now my body's gonna need energy, it's gonna look for it without restrictions. So we can get a little bit more into intermittent fasting. Yeah, Brad, I love carbs too. We can talk a little bit more about intermittent fasting, maybe on a Monday Night Live. But intermittent fasting is really focusing on a window where you're not eating, where you're doing a, what I call a clean fast. That means there's no bulletproof coffee. You're not adding fats or sugars or sweeteners, fake sweeteners to your coffee. You're having black coffee, black tea, water, no broth. You don't want to stimulate any digestion. The moment the body feels that there's food coming, even if that calorie or that, that sweetener is a zero calorie sweetener, it still thinks food is coming. So it's going to start the digestion process and release insulin putting you in storage mode, even if there's no calories. If I'm in storage mode, remember, I can't pull up that fat storage. And so intermittent fasting is not about restricting how much you eat necessarily. It's about restricting when you eat and allowing your body to become metabolically flexible. Our body can tap into glucose carbs when it's available, but is also able to tap into fats when glucose is not available, when there is no food in my system. And now there's more to that, but I want to get into a little bit of discussion around cortisol because that's the big one. Now we understand insulin. Okay. That's the storage hormone. And if I eat frequently, even if I'm intermittent fasting from 12 PM to 8 PM, all I did was nibble all day long. My insulin is high. If I learn to have less frequent meals and watch the glycemic index, watch the amount of carbs, especially the simple sugars, nothing refined. And I focus on really, a clean fast and trying as much as I can to regulate that insulin release throughout the day, I'm going to be in fat burning mode. But now cortisol. Cortisol is a steroid hormone that is released during fight or flight. That's sympathetic nervous system response. We have two systems in our autonomic nervous system. We have rest and digest, parasympathetic, where we're literally resting and recovering and healing and fighting off things that could be invasive to us. We're doing a process called the autophagy where we are killing anything that is mutating incorrectly. But when I'm feeling a threat, 
because let's say back in the day, a, super, a saber tooth tiger was attacking me, I release cortisol. That's my fight or flight response. And cortisol releases a surge of energy into your bloodstream, glucose, to help you fight or flee. And you know, the best time to use that cortisol is actually to exercise. You'll be able to lift harder. You'll be able to run faster. And that's what cortisol does for you. Now, cortisol is not a bad hormone. We need it. It helps regulate the nervous system. But when it's overly provoked, when the body for a long amount of time feels like it's under threat because I have environmental stress, I'm constantly around mold or toxic chemicals, for example, or maybe people around me are constantly making me feel negative. Maybe I've got a toxic relationship. Maybe I'm in a work environment that's not healthy for me. All of these stresses, and of course, pandemic and money and relationships, constantly keep my cortisol elevated. And now cortisol is a storage hormone. It releases a surge of energy into the body. And then it shuts down the gut, shut down the immune system. So now my gut is not functioning. It's not the primary place now where all the energy should be sent. Digestion is not that important right now. Fight or flight is. That's where my energy is allocated. And because of that, it also creates this massive capacity to start storing fat. If I'm in survival mode, I need energy. I have a surge of energy, but I also need to be in that place where if I eat something, I can store a massive quantity. I need it to fight or flight. And so the other thing it does for us is it gives us cravings for sugar. It makes us hungry. It starts to tamper with that ghrelin and leptin that we spoke about earlier. Because again, the primary function right now is survival. So how can we start to manage cortisol? And by the way, the most amount of cortisol receptors are located in the belly. These are glucocorticoid uh, receptors. So if you're constantly noticing that you have a harder time releasing fat around the abdomen, because there's four times as much glucocorticoid receptors in that area, then it's likely that you need to manage your stress. So instead of being or choosing to eat while you're in that stressed state, which a lot of us do, emotional eating, imagine instead you pattern interrupted and you did exercise instead, or you pattern interrupted and came to an event. So in order to get a hold of cortisol, we want to manage our stress. That's through meditation. If you're not certain what meditation is, just sitting down for five minutes and breathing, one-to-one -one breathing, where you have a hand on your chest, a hand on your belly, you're expanding through your belly, and then your chest, and then as you exhale, you release your chest and then your belly. And we have Amy Novotny in this group who is the master breather, and you should connect with her to learn more about some techniques. We also want to ma manage our sleep. We want to manage time to rest. And now that's something we could also schedule in. When do you just sit down and just be you and turn off your phone and turn off your computer and turn off everything that distracts you and just sit in your being and breathe? And what about watching something funny or listening to music, your favorite song and getting up and dancing, connecting with nature? When I reduce my cortisol, then I go into that melt mode. And so athletes, there's so much more I want to add and I'm already at 8.35. So my plan was 8.20 this morning, but I just want to leave you with some really quick tips because I really could go off for hours. As you look at your Sunday system for success, I want you to stop thinking about what you're going to do, but I want you maybe to start focusing on who you want to be. Stop thinking about dieting. Stop, stop thinking about that end result. I've never once thought about having a six pack. I've never once thought about 17% body fat. I really just thought about what can I do to be the athlete that I always thought I would be? What does that look like? What does my nutrition look like? What does my lifestyle look like? Focus always on consistency first, number one. Consistency first before intensity. Just learn to do 1% more every single day, not 100%. Again, if you've noticed that habit or that pattern of yours in the past that every single time you want to commit to something, it's all in. You go from working out zero times a week to five times a week for an hour. Maybe it starts with five minutes a day, twice a week, and then slowly ramp up. 
create that consistency. Once you've consistently hit that for 28 days, the next add a little bit more and then slowly start to bring up the intensity. And you know what? The intensity will come. The intensity will come and you will do this through love and kindness. It will not feel like a punishment. And now audit your environment. Number two, who are you spending time with? What's in your pantry right now? What's in your fridge right now that could be calling to you, that could be distracting you from your ultimate outcome? Who, who is that athlete that you've always envisioned yourself to be? And what do they eat? Do they eat what's in your fridge or what's in your pantry? Number three, manage your stress. This is huge. You manage your stress, you manage your cortisol. When you manage your stress, your growth hormone increases, your testosterone increases, helping you put on muscle. You see, these hormones are always in balance. Learn to make sleep. Number four, a ritual. What time do you go to bed? How do you wind down before bed? How many hours do you need to feel rested? How much coffee or caffeine are you having throughout your day? How much water are you drinking right before bed? Learn to really make that sleep uninterrupted and improve the quality of that sleep. Number five, your identity. Your identity is everything. Whoever you think you are, you're right. If you view yourself as that fat person who's constantly struggling, by the way, I hate that F word. I love the other F word, but this one, oof, I cringe every time I say it. And my girls, I have two girls, they're not allowed to say that at home. But if that's who you view yourself to be, you're gonna support that throughout your day. Number six, schedule it in. Just like you schedule your other things, make this a priority, make it non-negotiable. Nothing interrupts this. Even if you're feeling tired, even if you're not feeling like it, showing up and just doing five minutes creates consistency. It downloads that habit in your mind. It makes it a ritual for you. I don't hit my workouts the same every day, but I hit them all the time. Some days I crush it. Other days I'm crawling, but I make it. And I'm proud of myself for showing up. And now finally, number seven, celebrate. Celebrate every single time you show up because it's always so much easier not to. There's a million reasons not to. So athletes, with that, I apologize for the long rise with the tribe this morning, but it's hard to condense this and I love this. And I just wanna tell you that fitness is possible for everyone. Don't give up, stop dieting, it's not working. Stop focusing on the ultimate outcome and instead think about who you wanna be and now start scheduling that in. I am a constant resource for you. Please reach out if you need anything and let's maybe do a Monday Night Live where I'll do less of the talking and you guys can ask more questions. I love you all. Have a beautiful rest of your day. And remember, athletes, you got this.